since, you, since you've been in South Africa, is it getting worse? Obviously it is. <laughs> right? Isn't that scary? Um, it is getting worse. Uh, yes, it is scary. It is scary because I think for you guys, it's probably more more scary because you you don't really you're not used to something like this. I actually think for South, for a lot of South Africans, there's denial because we don't know and aren't exposed to how bad it can get. But you see, that's the problem because it can get bad. Uh, bad. Yes. And in countries that are in a bad situation now, it started like this. So I think that's the scary yeah, part. That's the scary part, <laughs> right? It. So you can get, you can actually get bad. You can get worse. Uh, welcome to the segment of Let's Talk Science with Tudi. I'm still with Dr. Emmanuel. And now we're going to try and find out more about what he does beyond science, what occupies his time. And specifically, I've said to him, I want to ambush him and I hope he allows me to ambush him. Um, I want to I wanna ask, so, so you've, how long have you now been in South Africa? Uh, about... Yeah, nine years, eight, nine years. Yeah. Eight, nine years. Mm -hmm. And you're obviously employed permanently at the university, yes, yeah. you know. So you're here legally. Yes, obviously. And now there's this whole um, movement, this Dubula movement mm -hmm. or Dudula movement that's taking place now in South Africa mm -hmm. where, I mean, just before we started recording, we were watching on, on EMCA, uh, I think his name is Ntanta Lax or something, and he's talking about how in Hillbro and they're pushing people out and you said such an interesting statement and you said well this is going to get out of control mm -hmm. let's talk a bit about first firstly how has your experience been in South Africa so well that's a really good question so I think my experience has been you know, lovely country um, mm -hmm. lovely people um, very lovely people so um, I might ha have had a biased experience because I've been, you know, I think all the years I've been here, it's mostly to us, you know, being in university, mm -hmm. being in school. It's contained. Yeah, it's kind of contained. That's why I say kind of biased. So mm -hmm. I think that's my experience in, 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 where, I know, I've met lovely people. I've been able to go, you know, see lovely places. But again, you know, you know I, w I would have a more biased look to us saying that um, this is, it's a country of opportunities, I think also that's mm. quite important, where there's a lot of opportunities across the board, If you, whether you are an academic mm. or a business person, I do think that this is a, a land of kind of opportunities. Um, South Africa is one of the uh, countries in Africa that has, you know, the structures are quite there, you know, so if, yeah, in every area, where if, if you want to go into, for example, into business, at least you have some structures, some structures there that, you can walk, that you can walk with. That is interesting because if we, if, if I had this conversation with a South African that say they don't feel like South Africa has opportunities for them and they don't feel like there are structures in South Africa for them that enable them to prosper within their businesses, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the different perspectives from which we, we look at South Africa, yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, is is what leads us to the different experiences that we have yes, yes. as a person that is South African versus a person who's not. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes, yes. So what do you, what do you say to... Um, why, why do you think you have the view of opportunity in South Africa, whereas people who are South Africans and live in South Africa don't see it that way. Where do you think, where do you think those different views come from? So uh, personally, I would say you know it. It's biased because of where probably I came from. You know. Yeah. yeah. So let's say let's let's come into specifics. So, for example, obviously now South Africa is having issues with you know electricity, for example. Mm. So versus you know where I come from in Nigeria, you know we. You live on generators. Exactly. We don't have that, yeah. uh, you know, electricity, you know, 24-hour electricity, or even the fact that, you know, 
Eskom would have to announce that so so and so time the electricity will go off. No, it doesn't happen. You know. So for you, that structure. So that's a bit of structure. Yeah. For, for me, you know, you know, because and also as you know, you guys would know, for example, that you know, um, you know, if it's inefficient power supply, for example, that affects businesses, for example. Yes. So the very basics of like, for example, having a kind of a constant power supply. It's on its own a foundation for whether it's business or academia. Yeah, yeah. You know, the fact that, for example, in academia where you some you know students have things online because of access to electricity and data, um, that will be difficult in some areas uh, back home because oh, yeah. of again electricity issues and things like that. Like a, a more constant electricity issue. Yes. Yeah, so than so that that alone is something what I refer to maybe. As the basics, kind of, uh, you know, really basics, and I hope it doesn't get worse in South Africa. But that that alone is a is a really good basic yeah. that people can actually use to. Since you, since you've been in South Africa, is it getting worse? Obviously, it's it is right. Isn't worse. that scary? Um, it is getting worse. Uh, yes, it is scary. It is scary because I think for you guys, up is probably more more scary because you you don't really you don't used to something like this. I actually think for for a lot of South Africans there's denial because we don't know and aren't exposed to how bad it can get. But you see that's the problem because it can get bad uh, bad. Yes. And in countries that are in a bad situation now it started like this. So I think that's the scary yeah, part. That's the scary part, <laughs> right? So it can get, it, it can actually get bad. It, it can get worse, and it starts like this, where you start having tw from twenty four hours to you know not constant, exactly. and before you know it, you know, like we're also watching where they say areas who have both days without electricity. Electricity, yeah. So I think that's what scares people, and the, it, it's actually a legitimate scare because again, like I said, it's how. It starts and it progresses you know, towards uh, to a towards point where we have serious noise hope, pollution with generators. <laughs> we hope, right? we hope it, it does. It, but you can also see that in, in some complexes and uh, people are now opting for having generator uh, yeah, solar panel. UPS, because, yeah. yeah, even ESCOM knows for sure that you know they can't get this into they can't solve this problem in years with to come. Coal. Yeah, but coal isn't sustainable, right? Yes, but yeah, exactly. So, so. It's 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 scary, and I understand the mm -hmm. legitimate uh, you know concerns of of a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, and then um, how how bad can this uh, Dudula situation get according to you? Because right now it's obviously the focus is on you know it's it's illegal immigrants, it's people that are perhaps uh, participating in more criminal activity and. Do you do you get the feeling that it may spill over to just the general mm. uh, person who is not South African? So you see, I think that's a concern, and I just need to clarify that you know these are legitimate concerns that are being mm. raised by people, uh, concerns of illegal uh, migrants, concerns of crime, concerns of un unemployment. These are really legitimate mm -hmm. and I think uh, the government will have to find a way to address these issues because, because mm -hmm. these are serious issues and, and uh, no country should have porous borders for example. Mm -hmm. So these are legitimate issues. Um, so what my concern we were speaking about before the, this interview was the issue of it's a very thin line between who is illegal or you know because even if you go on Twitter there's a real huge it, it, it goes very quickly because obviously the people that starts this uh, movement and mm -hmm. obviously they are very specific in saying illegal migrants yeah. and, and things like that. But you find that people that you know respond to them or follow them and things mm -hmm. like that, it's very difficult for you to have the distinction between, between illegal, illegal and legal. And, this, and so in most cases you find that you find you know tweets or posts that are not really specific to illegal migrants mm -hmm. but they'll say Nigerians or Zimbabweans, uh, this and that, and that, I think that's where it becomes problematic. It becomes problematic because then it, it begins to shape your idea that every Nigerian is a criminal, which uh, is not the case. Uh, for example, myself, you know, you know, you know, you know I'm here legally. Yeah. You know, kind of work, you know, we do. We're trying to look for solutions. I'm mm -hmm. very much involved in, you know, supervision, teaching, mentorship, and so on and so forth. So. So it's very difficult to have that, you know, to to define properly 
you know, mm. you know that this is actually for it, legal immigrants, especially for the general public, right? I think that's the problem. Like I said, you know, yeah. people, people that lead this uh, movement and also they are they're they more clearly aware. they're more aware and they clearly say that. We our fight is for illegal, illegal yeah. uh, migrants, and that's a that's a legitimate fight. But you see that the general public, you you find that even through posts and tweets, that yeah. there's no distinction. It's yeah. Nigerian. It's and of course, this is this is now on the back of. Uh, I was listening to Dr. Arun Motswaledi uh, in one of the interviews with uh, just after the State of the Nations address. And, and he was talking about how, you know, um, America and China um, and India and Nigeria constitute about a third of the world's population. So you need to have some kind of a system that is easier for the people that come from those countries to come into, into South Africa. So now they're doing this whole e-visa system. Mm -hmm. And this is on the back of... Like it, 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 for me, it's such an interesting thing because you have Dr. Arun Motolady saying, so we're doing e-visas and Nigerian, the Nigerian uh, um, citizens can use this e-visa to come into the country. But at the same time, you have the general public, as you're saying, that is not necessarily leading the movement of um, cleaning up the illegal immigrant uh, um, culture that we're seeing in South Africa. But you, you're hearing those two narratives. There's an e-visa system. Nigerians must go. Nigerians, Kevin, you know, and how does that? Isn't that like confused? Because that can be confusing as well for the general public, think, right? Yes, I think, I think, I think it, it could be, and I think again, it, it's for us to clearly define it. So, I do not think that people that are here legally, because for you to be here legally in South Africa, you yeah. must state why you are being here. If yeah. you, are you are you here for study or for work, and you must state the business that you have in, or you know that. So. I do not think the issue is legal migration, mm -hmm. and obviously that's why the government tries looking for a way to get more like legal because it, it's not worldwide. If mm -hmm. they are legal migrants, they can bring in skills, they can skills bring in transfer and yeah. things like that. So the issue is not really legal. I think the problem and, and what the government would need to address is illegal people mm -hmm. that are here illegal or came through illegally. So if you went through, for example, the visa process or the e visa process. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of lots of documentation will be submitted and mm -hmm. everything, and it goes through a rigorous check for you to be in South Africa, and that's legal. That's a legal uh, mm -hmm. way. The, on the other hand, there are you know various ways where people can get in illegally, and I think that's the issue. That's the mm -hmm. problem. And that's what mm -hmm. government should be should be uh, wary of. For, so, for example, if someone comes into South Africa here, yeah, Nigerian students to study, you know, for example, that so so and so is. In Virts University, studying mm. for a master's so you of can science track that person. in molecular biology. So they are registered, and he or she stays in so so and so place. Yeah. So if the government wants to look for that person, he can They'll go straight them. to the university and say, "We have international, we have all those things, we have all the structure yeah. in place," and they find them. So that's fine. The problem is someone that comes maybe maybe across the border or you know stays here and overstays there, this and, and they don't have any records. So that's when it pro uh, that, that, that's the problem. So you see. These are really legitimate concerns, but it still boils down to be able to distinguish, especially for the general public, between mm -hmm. someone that came, came here legally, doing, trying to do things legally, whether it's study mm -hmm. or work, versus someone that's here illegally and, mm -hmm. and trying to do something criminal. And it can be a bit threatening for people that are here legally. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's, that's problematic. That's right? very problematic, because they are, they are actually you know, foreign nationals uh, uh, from countries such as Nigerians that are actually here legally yeah. and do things legally. I was speaking to a friend, I think a couple of years ago, and they were saying that, um, yeah, no, and I, you see, and they're Nigerians, they're, Ni they're a Nigerian friend of mine, and, mm. and he was saying that Nigerians truly don't sell drugs the way they do in South Africa, mm. in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. they, this is the problem that you guys have with illegal um Nigerians where drugs are concerned, we don't have it in Nigeria. They're not selling these drugs like this. Is that true? I don't think that's a true statement. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> they get caught in Nigeria. They get, you know, there's yeah. repercussions in Nigeria. Yeah, yeah, it's open sesame. So, so again, you know, I, I, I don't think, and this might get me into trouble, I don't think South Africa is unique to, to the problems of things like drug yeah. and this, uh, the, the issue, uh, what, 
what makes the South African case quite unique is obviously the socio-economic problems that you know uh, yeah. South Africans are facing. The so poverty and the, the increase in poverty, jobs. the increase in unemployment, yeah. and when all those things are put in context, then it really makes that situation quite exacerbated. It exa exacerbates the situation. Exactly. So. If, for example, the government or private sector decides to create one million jobs today, for example, and the unemployment falls from is it for something percent in uh, to below ten percent, uh, government we, doesn't create jobs. Exactly, we had, we had that recently. <laughs> that's why I'm saying government and private sector. Yeah. But if it falls to below ten percent, for example, mm. would we be having oppression to do that, for example? It's no, question. maybe crime would would go down, right? Exactly. Maybe even taxes would tax would go down exactly. as well. Exactly. So so obviously South Africa is quite unique in the sense that it has its own unique issues, a socioeconomic issues that it has to deal with, uh, and obviously its history and everything. So I think that makes it unique in that sense. Yeah, I mean, um, should we have? Should we be more Pan-African? Should we let go of the borders? Um, should we let go of the borders in Africa? <laughs> of course, so, if we let go of the borders right now, it, there's going to be like a descent to South Africa, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think... Um, so the idea of Pan-Africanism, it's, it's a great idea. Isn't it's, it? Yeah, yeah, it is a great I idea. I love it. The idea of open border, I think, and I think uh, it's something that our leaders should be really open to hope, you know, very soon because just the fact that things like free trade and everything, but mm -hmm. but we should have more open Africanism, we should have more open mm -hmm. borders. But it is quite difficult to to have it, in, you know, now where there's just so much happening in the different African states, mm. and you know, and the inequities, and the inequities, yeah. you know, yeah. saying, it's quite, it's so, it's quite difficult. It makes it very much complex. So yeah. you say places like Europe, the reason why, you know, they have these open borders here and there, you know, between France mm. and Italy, is that, because there isn't that much dependence between the different states. Right? Yeah, and there's no much, you know, differences between you the know, economy, the economy, and you know, the, yeah. you know, obviously, again, there's some kind of stability you know you know you know, you yeah. know that there's a recent spate of things like um, what's it called where the army is taking over coups it, absolutely uh, yeah, so yeah, this yeah. instability there's a fear of instability in regions such as yeah. west africa so you, we can't really have things like that and then we're talking about opening borders and you know there's terrorism that we need to deal with so exactly. so I, I think obviously the idea is really great and and we cannot go forward as a continent without standing together and being pan African. Because the thing is, um, and, and you know, um, Tawon Begi used to, former president Tawon Begi, um, the emphasis on we need to assist the other country so that the other country's problems don't affect us. Yes. And if, and if more African leaders had that sort of thinking, um, I know that uh, President Paul Kagame is, is, is also, mm. you know, he's got interesting ways of doing it because we've seen what he's doing in Mozambique, what mm. he's done in Mozambique and so on. So the, he's got interesting yeah, ways. In, yeah, the Rwandan, the Rwandan president mm. um, assisting in the challenges in, in Mozambique, oh, okay, right? Yeah. So we see how he's doing that. Mm. And, and I mean, I think I have slight issues with it. I, you know, I, I debate his methods. But, but the need for more, more African leaders to be interested in fixing the neighbor's problem or the person that's across the, you know, across the mountain, I think becomes very important in us being able to really um, limit maybe or, or, or the iniquities that we have across countries, right? Absolutely. So if you do not help your neighbor, soon the neighbor's problem because becomes, becomes yours. yours. Yeah. So we, we you've seen it in maybe fighting Boko Haram in Nigeria or Cameroon, for example, where it it's now becoming an issue of the region. Of the region. Yeah. So Absolutely. you you would need to help, you know, as much as you can. Um, your neighbor so that mm. their problems would not so because whether you like it or not mm. 
you know, you would somehow begin to absorb some of those, those problems mm -hmm. if you don't help as early as you can. And in South Africa, we're not immune to Boko Haram and ISIS. We're not immune to it. We're not immune to it. Yeah. We may not necessarily but, but also, be aware, but yeah. we're not immune to it, right? But also, I think um, African countries individually as their own should also take responsibility. responsibility. So obviously, you would need help from your, your neighbors mm -hmm. and your fellow African countries or whatever it is. You need to take charge. But you need to take, you also need to take charge of your own country, yeah. you know, because, you know, we still, in some of these countries still have issues with corruption and, and stuff like that, that makes it very difficult to deal with things like mm -hmm. that. And so you, we need to really take control of our, our country and not just waiting for the other countries. Because the other countries mm -hmm. have their own issues. Their own you know? issues. So definitely yeah. we need to help our neighbor. But that but neighbor, starts at home first. Yeah, but that neighbor really has to take responsibility. Yeah. We can't be dealing with things like corruption yeah. within the country and the other neighbor is trying yeah. to help. So I, suppose, to I suppose that's what uh, the, the going hashtag, I think, on Twitter is hashtag put South Africa first and I think that's what that speaks to it. Mm. Um, let's fix here first before we're trying to fix the problems of everyone else. But at the same time, um, can they coexist? The, the assistance of my neighbor, can it coexist with me assisting myself in my own home? And, I, and, and, and I, I'm very optimistic and I want to say that um, with, the, with the right people and with the right teams and with the right um, objectives, you're able to really tackle both issues of assisting your neighbor as well as assisting yourself and taking charge um, with, with, with advancing yourself. Um, these are very um, exciting issues for me to discuss. Not exciting in that they themselves are exciting, but I just think it's important uh, that we have these conversations in this way. And I mean, I think we could have spoken about um, how you hike and we could have spoken about um, your contribution to assisting um, young people or, or, or really building succession planning through mentorship and etc. Et but I'm really just uh, thankful that you engaged me on this topic of Africanism and this whole Dudula movement and so on and I really appreciate that you came through to my home. Um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. Yeah, I did actually. It was uh, quite an interesting. We went from pancreatic cancer to uh, discussing the uh, uh, issues with, with Africa. But I think it was really, and I think it's not isolated, these are not isolated issues. In issues, I, I think yeah. We try to say that this is a science and this is some, you know, policy. But I think they're all, uh, you know, intertwined. They're linked. Yeah, yeah they're and very express, much related. You express that relation um, every day of your life. So mm. they're not different concepts. But yeah, it's really nice, nice chatting to you. I, I don't know how I can give a better closing to this uh, than what Emmanuel just uh, said. Definitely, the, the sciences and politics and uh, the systems that we live within um, are all interrelated. And it is very, being multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, um, even across the borders of science and with, you know across the borders of technology where we're able to really link um, the sciences and link them to the politics and see really how there's a marriage between the two or how they are related and I think this for me has been such an eye-opening um, conversation and I hope it was eye-opening and informative for you as well. Uh, I'll see you again uh, next time. Do subscribe, do like, do comment, do let us know what you want us to talk about um, whatever it is that you want us to talk about, we'll try and find a person who does research in that area. Uh, remember, it's Let's Talk Science with Tuli. You should be able to find us pretty much everywhere. Cheers for now. See you next time.